Everybody's got a story, you just have to listen. Hola, I'm Joe Partavilla, and this is Good Listen, and today, Stephanie Harrison tells her story. Doesn't happiness feel hard these days? Well, for Stephanie, she's made it her mission in life to share a new science-backed philosophy of happiness. We're going to get into her new book, New Happy, why the old happy is making us miserable, and how we can all get better at being happy. Stephanie, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here with you. I'm excited to talk about happiness. Uh, And I love to tell the story that uh, growing up, my mother had one job for me and my brother. It was, we could do whatever we wanted in life, but two things. We had to be happy what we were doing, and we had to be nice to people. That was it. My mother was a Cuban refugee. She she came here to the States with literally like the shirt on her back. And she just knew the importance of happiness and treating people well were pretty much like the secrets to life. And wow. um, I feel like I've kind of carried that. And obviously I'm human. So I'm, there's some days I'm dicks to people like we all are, but I try to be as self-aware as possible. So can you tell me about the word happy and how that became such an important <laughs> facet for you? Because to me, it sort of, it, it, it like lives in my DNA, like happiness, like, yeah, right. and, but, but uh, wh- where does it come from with you? Well, first of all, I have to say that I think your mom um, figured out the entire secret to happiness and I should just go home because she should just be on this podcast or she should be, we should be celebrating her wisdom because she nailed it, to be honest. That is a hundred percent it. Um, So, I mean, my understanding of the word happiness was really, was probably pretty different because it was colored by a lot of the messages that I had received growing up about what I needed to do and who I needed to be in order to be happy. It was like happiness was a condition of something else, right? A result of something that you did in your life in order to get to that state. And unfortunately, what I've discovered through my research is that a lot of those messages that tell us what we should do and be, they're actually wrong. And not only are they not making us happy, but they're actually leading us to misery. So we need to bring some attention to that and start to address it. And the idea of the science of happiness, which is your bag, Stephanie, uh, to me, I find hard to relate those two because to me, happiness has sort of been, is sort of this ephemeral feeling. Like you can't put, like you can't, like it's described happy. Like, like, you know, if you look it up in a dictionary, I'm sure there's like a big long sentence of of a mishmash of words, (laughs) but it means nothing. Um, So tell me about the intersection of happiness and science. Well, it's, what's really interesting is what you're talking about, the idea of what defines happiness and how do we measure it, is something that scientists have been arguing about for a long time and philosophers even for longer before that. So a lot of scientists have come up with different measures to try and capture that elusive nature of what you're describing of the state of happiness, which all of us know what it feels like, but it's really hard to describe it. And so some of them describe it as a satisfaction with your life. Some of them think about it as Uh, the mood that you tend to be in along with your projection of how you're going to feel in the future. There's all sorts of these different ways of trying to articulate and explain what it is. Um, But to me, that's not actually the thing that we should be paying the most attention to. We should be paying attention to all of the beliefs about what we're told to do in order to get to that state of being. Because if you believe, for example, like so much of our culture tells us that if you're successful, then you will be happy. But your mom's advice was go do something that makes you happy and you'll likely be successful, right? Mm-hmm. So having some sort of questioning around these cultural norms and identifying how do we, if we all know what happiness feels like, then maybe we should be attending more to the instructions of how to get to that state of being. Interesting. Uh, and I know you kind of embrace this sort of new happiness philosophy mm-hmm. that you've created. And I've really gotten into philosophy okay. later in life. Uh, you know, I'm a middle aged white guy. So stoicism my, is my thing now, Stephanie. So I, I hate to be so cliche about it. But <laughs> I've really gotten into stoicism lately. And what I love about it is that it is I, I kind of like dwindle it down to you can control what you can control. Like, yeah. I know stoicism is more than that. But I feel like if you come from the mindset of the only things in your life that you have control over are the things you can't, the, the, the things you do. Like everything else, it is what it is. Yeah. Uh, and I kind of love that. And, I've, and in a way, I've sort of lived like that before. But yeah, like yeah. every human being, I would get in my own head yeah. about what what is that person doing? Why are they doing that? <laughs> um, so yeah. talk to me about the happiness philosophy. And, and I will say before you answer that, I yeah. always feel like philosophy has a yeah. terrible PR person or a terrible like – uh, like messaging because you know i signed up for philosophy in college it was philosophy 101 and i was bored out of my gourd <laughs> like it was so bad like i was expecting to 
to hear about Greek <laughs> philosophers and and all these wonderful people. And it was just so boring that I, yeah. I think I got like a C plus or something like that. So um, <laughs> why is philosophy so screwed up? Because I feel like it could be so helpful, but oh, it, totally. they make it they make it so much they make it harder on themselves. <laughs> It's so true. Is. Like it's it's the human problem, isn't it? We make things harder than they have to be in so yeah. many ways. Like philosophy to me is a way of life, right? It's a set of instructions for helping you to live your life. And I think we all want that. We all want guideposts and signs. And even to your point about saying, I was already practicing a lot of stoicism before I even knew or delved into it in depth. But then I had the language and the framework and the support to help me to better understand it, right? That's the power of it. And so when I was trying to describe what I had come up with, I landed on philosophy because I wanted it to be like that set of guidance that could support people as they're thinking about how to live their lives. But really, the the new happy philosophy argues that if you want to be happy, then the very best way to do that is to be who you really are and then use yourself to help other people. So it's simply embracing who you can be and all of the amazing talents and gifts and capabilities that you have within you and then figuring out what you can do to offer them up to others in hopes of making the world a better place. That will lead to not only your happiness, but also the happiness of others. And eventually, if more and more of us switch our definition to something more like this, the happier world we can create together. I love that. And when you when you bring the word philosophy into it, it's almost like bringing a new religion. Do, is there like pushback from people like like, you know, I, as much as people like to make fun of Scientologists and stuff, the only reason people make fun of Scientology is because it was created in our lifetime. If it was created 200 years ago, people would be like, oh, my God, it's a real thing. But because totally. we're so full of ourselves now that we're like, there can never be a new religion, new philosophy, because everything that's been written has been done. Yeah, so tell exactly. me about trying to, to incorporate the word philosophy into what you do. That's such a great point. You know, I think um, maybe I've been subconsciously pushing back against that because, you know, there is so much wisdom to be gained from uh, ancient philosophy and from past lessons of religion or spirituality or, um, you know, of general thought. But, you know, the human condition is the same, but the circumstances that we live in now are different. And we need an approach that acknowledges that. And so when I was thinking about what our world needs, what even what I need to navigate our world, I wanted something that would be reflective and allowing me to incorporate a lot of the the realities that I see when I walk out my front door. You know, we have many, many challenges that we're facing as a country, as a group of people, as um, as a planet. And any sort of meaningful philosophy that's developed now needs to incorporate and address those in my belief. And so I've taken a lot of the great findings from other, you know, schools of thought and and um, and and other philosophies as well, but tried to bring it together into something that's uh, that's modern and, and works for this time. But what those other guys didn't have, and most of them were guys, of course, which is of another course. point. <laughs> yeah. Um, what they didn't have was the science to show, hey, maybe some of our intuitions are correct. Maybe there are things that we're missing, and so it's also incorporating all of that research to help validate it further. Yeah, I wonder, and I want to talk about the challenge of coming mm -hmm. to this because I feel like a lot of people don't like to challenge <laughs> themselves. And I'm, uh, my yeah. wife hates it, but I always love to have conversations with people who have different beliefs than I in public yeah. settings, and it mm -hmm. drives her crazy. So I'm a, a New York liberal. Uh, you know, I, 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 again, I'm the cliche New York liberal, but I, uh, but I'm, uh, but, I, but what I'm, what I push back on is the fact that. I don't have a problem being friends with a conservative or yeah. being friends with someone who voted for Trump that I can well, separate the two. And I, yeah. I like to challenge people and myself in conversations. So I was just talking to someone the other day who's a client of mine, served yeah. in the military, and I was just talking about uh, guns. Uh, yeah. I, again, I don't know why I'm bringing this stuff up. My wife hates what I do, but we were doing it in a one on one setting. And uh, we, I previously, you know, I moved down to South Carolina and obviously mm -hmm. it's a gun culture here. And a lot of the friends I have down here, they all have guns and they go shooting. Right. So I, just out of like shits and giggles, I'm like, no, let me go shoot. Let me go shoot with these guys. And, yeah. it was, and, I, and, and, and honestly, it was pretty boring. Like after a while shooting at the same target is, is nothing to me. Um, but, I, but the one thing that I, I've, and I talked to my friends down here and they kind of agree with me to a certain extent, but you know, yeah. I always say, Hey, it's, I don't have a problem with gun ownership. My problem is we make it too goddamn easy to have guns in this country. Right. So I said it to this, to this gentleman I work with mm -hmm. and, military guy and he goes well sure but conversely you can say the same thing about the first amendment 
when the mm-hmm. when the when the founding fathers wrote that, they didn't know there was going to be YouTube and TikTok. The same mm-hmm. as they when it came to guns, they didn't know that you'd be able to fire a hundred rounds in a second. Mm-hmm. And so it just like blew my mind, Stephanie, mm-hmm. because I'd been so insulated and just talking yeah. about like the flaw in the Second Amendment, mm-hmm. not even thinking about the flaws in the First Amendment, one yeah. that I'm a big fan of. Um, yeah. So and and I'll be, and Stephanie for like a, for the last twenty four hours, I've been thinking about that conversation. And yeah. I'm just like hit, hit, and like and almost like. Not punishing myself, but like, okay. F Joe, like, you, you, of course, like, why wouldn't you think that as well? Uh, yeah. and, but I, and I, I, I kind of dig that discomfort, but that yeah. the discomfort of challenging yourself is really hard for a lot of people. So tell me about how sure. do, working through this philosophy, creating it, writing the book, and challenging yourself to mm. probably think the pre existing notions yeah. that you had before you went into the science. Tell yeah. me about that struggle. What a great story. Thanks for sharing that. I also am probably somebody who likes that level of discomfort in some ways. Um, I think I'm probably more comfortable with intellectual discomfort than I was with emotional discomfort. Like I have had to learn a lot about facing difficult feelings like fear and shame and anger and that kind of stuff. But for ideas in this way, I'm I am also always interested in having conversations with people who don't share my beliefs or ideas because you learn so much, right? And I think what's really interesting about that story and how I think it connects to my own journey is that I was so locked into my own worldview that I never even considered that it was wrong, to your point. Like I never even questioned that what I believed, which was that if you're successful, if you can, you know, make a lot of money, if you can be popular, if you can do A, B, and C, then you will get to be happy. Like I never questioned that belief until the one moment that I finally did. And then it was like the blinds came off, right? Like, and you start to see the world in a whole new way. And so I think that for for the journey of coming up with the philosophy and writing this book, a lot of it was how do I challenge those preconceived notions and ideas that I have? And where can I draw from different influences to help me to figure that out? And if we were to, it's almost like if we were to eliminate any sort of belief system that we have about happiness and start fresh, what would that look like? That was almost the mentality that I tried to bring to it to figure out what would be what would be what would it look like to build something new that wasn't relying on any of these old stories and myths and archetypes that we've been leaning on yeah and w- t- let's talk about the external internal because like you said then, like you chase the external to, yeah. to, to for the internal um yeah and you, as a scientist and, and doing all this stuff <laughs> where does that come from you think where does it where do you think that like if we bought this car we 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 buy this gadget it'll make us happy is that just in our DA from caveman times? Like, where do you think that comes from? And again, this is, it doesn't have to be a scientific answer. I'd just love to know what your take is on that. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I think part of it is um, there is a part of our nature that's wired to pursue things like comfort and safety and um, wants to ensure that we're protected. And in the modern world, that obviously can take the form of money and resources and things like that. We also have been highly conditioned by these forces, um, which I call old happy. Uh, it's my kind of shorthand for these these beliefs that we've developed about happiness and well-being. And really, you know, from an early age, we're conditioned into this set of values about what matters to our society. Who are the people that we look up to? You know, who do we celebrate in the world and in the media? What does it look like to live a good life? We have these ideas about it, and they come from you know forces like capitalism and individualism that help us to come up with a worldview of understanding what matters most in our society. And then because we also have a biological desire to conform and to be seen and esteemed by other people, we naturally want to fulfill the brief that we've been set by our culture. And so we set goals that help us to work towards it. And we devote our lives towards meeting certain norms, even if they don't actually make us happy. It's so funny. One of the things, and as you can tell, Stephanie, I'm a very simple person. Uh, one of the things I never try to, um, I never try to analyze what people do or question or second guess. I Monday morning quarterback. I, I you know, again, stoicism. You know, I control what I control. The one question I do ask is when someone does something. I and I say it to myself, but does that make them happy? Like when uh... someone does something that's crude or rude or just mean. I always wonder, like, is that making them feel good? And right. you can look, you know, you can look at it from the political discourse in this country, or just you know logging on to Twitter. 
for yeah. crying out loud. I, 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 I wonder, like, does saying mean things or being a bully or just or just being unkind make people happy? How do you? How do you, how does that inform you in a way? Because I, because since you know so much about it, have you ever wondered like, why would someone say that? Like, what are they getting yeah. out of it? And uh, to me again, simple Joe, I'm, I'm like, Stop. are they doing that because it makes them happy? They might be doing it because it makes them feel happy in a different sense than the way I'm using the word happy. It might okay. give them a sense of power or energy or of, uh, like releasing a pressure valve on their feelings, like kind of allowing some of the steam to come off. Um, they might think that in the long run, dominating somebody or beating them up or bullying them will make them happy in some way. Um, and also they might be doing it to alleviate their pain. So the question I usually ask myself when I see people behaving in those ways is what pain is driving this? Because something is happening in their lives or has happened in their lives that has made them believe that the best way to pursue their own happiness is through bringing others down. But in reality, it's just like what your mom said, the best way to experience happiness is to bring others up, to be kind to them. Yeah. I mean, do you sometimes feel, and I don't want you to question your career choices, but it's like, man, what am I doing in this insane world that we're living in? <laughs> I'm writing about happiness. I mean, me and my wife have made the intentional decision of not watching the news that much anymore. Like we'll yeah. throw on like while we're, while we're having dinner, I will throw on the nightly news in the background just and get, yeah. you know, we're finding out if something's going on. The world. But we've intentionally pulled it. And I know a lot of my friends have done this as well. Just like, yeah, yeah. You know, and, and it's tough at dinner parties because you'll be like, hey, did you see that thing? And be like, nope, I didn't see that thing. And vice versa, no <laughs> it happens to other people. Um, but we're, there's so much negativity in this world. Yeah, Is it hard for you to create this, this philosophy, put out this book and all the work you're doing do you feel like sometimes you, you're you're almost like it's an uphill battle? Oh, what a great question. I mean, I think that I think that it sometimes feels hard, but it feels so necessary. Like it feels like this work is more and more important than ever. And I think, you know, something that the philosophy argues is that the way that we pursue happiness for ourselves doesn't happen in a vacuum. We have an impact upon other people. So for example, in the case of those individuals that you were just describing, if somebody is bullying another person because they think it will make them happy, that doesn't just have an impact on that person. It affects the person who they're bullying and their family and their friends and anyone else who might be caught in the line of fire. So the way that we, the way that we're pursuing happiness right now is making everybody miserable in my belief. So <laughs> That's the problem. Like if we have a wrong idea of happiness and it's making us unhappy, then that's the source of all this negativity that we're seeing and this chaos and stress and all the problems that we're facing in the world. So in many ways, I feel a sense of responsibility to to kind of like wave my little flag for anyone who's interested and say like, hey, there is a better way. Like we can we can kind of find it together. That's awesome. I love that. Um, and w w as you're crafting this, uh, I wonder, and you, you talk about the blinders that you had on and you blew them off. Is that something that you actually need to put back on while you're working in doing this work? Because if you try to, if, if a lot of that negativity comes in, does it cloud what you're doing? It, it, I mean, in a way, do you have to, you know, silo has become such a negative term in the world of business, but like, do you always have to silo yourself off so you stay in sort of this little happy, happy bubble? Uh, no, actually, you know, what's interesting. So if, you know, because I would say one of the core values at the heart of this philosophy is compassion and compassion for yourself, compassion for others, compassion for the world. And the only way to get better at compassion is through meeting pain, through being attuned to other people's suffering and practicing being there for it. So in many ways, like it's almost as though there is a way to use the pain that we see so, so much around us. And it can be something that allows us to cultivate our best selves and and to then experience more happiness and joy. So I don't feel like I have to kind of hide away from people who are struggling in any way. It actually only helps me to become a better person by making myself available to them in the ways that I can. Oh, that's great. Um, and one of the words that came out during the pandemic, uh, mm -hmm. well, there were a lot of them that, you know, pivoted <laughs> and, and silos as well. But the other was empathy. And mm -hmm. I, I like to joke that it took a global pandemic for leaders to learn empathy. Uh, <laughs> can you take us back to when that all, that word started 
having yeah. prominence back in 2020? Um, because obviously you've been doing this work for years, but like all of a sudden 2020, hey, have you heard about this word empathy? <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, um, you know, leaders weren't, they weren't allowed to ignore people's pain anymore. Like it was too present. And before we had this wall between the home and the workplace where if you were struggling at home, then you never let on about it in your work, right? If, if you did, it was very, very carefully done and with a lot of caution, I would imagine. Um, but when the pandemic happened, not only did that wall come crashing down, but also sometimes you even had a front row seat to it because it was on video conference, right? Like your parents handling their kids as they're trying to attend meetings and people struggling to figure out how to pay their bills and everything like that. So to me, it was almost like leaders could no longer ignore it and they had to actually pay attention to it. And that's why it became so popular. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I, I keep getting flashbacks at times that like, I remember when, remember when Zoom was taking off and people were doing like these large Zoom calls. Yeah. I remember, I remember hearing people say, oh, I look at these Zooms and everyone looks sad and everyone looks like it, what, you know, when no one's smiling and I'm like thinking to myself, like, what, what are we going to smile about? Like, first of all, you're in a meeting. If like, if you were in an office having the same meeting, you wouldn't be smiling. But of course, everything is magnified because everything's yeah. on a giant screen and everything just became uh, magnified during the pandemic. And now that we're, you know, four years yeah. on now, what do you think of the, I guess, the after effects uh, or the, the impact that that's had yeah. on happiness? I think people are really traumatized and they haven't had the chance to process that trauma. Like we lived through a, a historic event, right? Like, and we've been living through historic events for a little while. Like we have, we have not put in the place, the support or the structure to help people to reckon with what happened. Even if you didn't know somebody who was personally affected by the pandemic, you witnessed a lot of it, right? And the fear and the stress that was so pervasive for so many months for so many people, we haven't we haven't taken the time to process that. And I think that that leaves people with a lot of that buried pain that unfortunately can come out in the form of aggression or anger or uh, like frustration and kind of other non-pro-social behavior. And so if if there was something that I could kind of like wave a magic wand and do for all of us right now, it would be to give everybody the space and the support to just give themselves some, you know, like love and care for what, what we went through and the resources to help process that a little bit more. I think it would really help everybody to, to, to actually move on. Whereas right now I think we're, we're kind of pretending that we're moved on, but we're not really, we haven't had that reckoning. Yeah. Uh, and I'm old enough to remember, uh, let's get into the mental health of this all. I'm old enough to remember when, when, when someone was fighting any kind of mental health issues, someone would just plainly and blankly slay, why can't you just be happy? Yeah. We've obviously grown from that time, but I, mean, I, I know like millennials and Gen Z may, may find that hard to believe, but there was a yeah. time where it was perfectly acceptable to say to someone who's not feeling well, why can't you just be happy? We've yeah. moved on from that point. But okay. let's talk about the idea of, of happiness in 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 sort of the realm of mental health yeah thank goodness we've we've got so much so much more knowledge about about how to support people i think it's interesting that you say that because i think i agree with you like i think we've come so far and also now it's almost like that default response that people had about oh just like cheer up or you know just make yourself feel better or whatever now there's a gap where people don't know what to say to help people in some ways, right? Like we haven't been given a new script or set of tools or resources to approach it. And I think um, that impulse that we have when we see somebody who we love who is struggling, we want them to feel better, right? Like that's the core impulse driving it. And if you think that mental health is something that you can think your way out of, then those people saying that are just trying to help right? They're trying to problem solve. But what I think is more important is recognizing that when people are suffering, when they're struggling with their mental health or other challenges in their lives, you don't need to fix it. You just need to be there with them. You just need to be on the journey with them and not leave them. Because in reality, like we are all strong and we have amazing resilience and with the right support, almost everything can be overcome. But you need that support. You need other people to be there for you. And so 
if you have somebody in your life who's struggling with their mental health, the best advice I can give is try to just be there, like be in it with them. And that will do more than any advice that you can offer or any fixes that you try and share. That's great. Uh, and out of curiosity, if you don't mind sharing, uh, little Stephanie Harrison growing up, uh, was what was what was what was she looking forward to in the future? Was was something in this realm that you're doing now or what what because I I always when people like you have these amazing careers that are just unusual for lack yeah. you know it's, it's you know there's not a lot of people that are happy philosophers it's not it's just not a <laughs> um, thing it's not like firefighter or policeman no it's um, very weird <laughs> oh, oh I don't find it I find it cool but uh but what do you think about like looking back as a kid and what you thought your life was going to be and what it ended up being Little Stephanie Harrison, uh, very little Stephanie Harrison wanted to be a writer or an artist. So in many ways, I feel like I've honored that very little part of me. But then probably starting around like age 11 or so, I started to think that I needed to be um, like successful, something, whatever that looked like, whether that was a business executive or I wanted to be the editor of a fashion magazine for a while. Um, I wanted to be an actress. I wanted to kind of, um, that I wanted to be, have my own business and all these different things. Right. I had all of these other ideas. So it was almost like for a period of my life, I got, I got lost and then, uh, eventually was able to come back to what really felt authentic and what mattered to me. And, and what ended up mattering to you? Like, was it just, yeah. because I guess that's the thing, I guess we all find that <laughs> point in our life where like, we were doing all this, that just, that we're yeah. chasing happiness. Uh, whether it's career, whether it's relationships, but when did you realize to have that Oprah aha moment that was like, this this is what matters. This is what I'm going to put, you know, all my eggs in the proverbial basket. It was realizing that uh, real happiness comes from helping other people, and the more that I could find ways to do that, the the happier I personally would become. It's very. Um, you know, kind of selfish selflessness in a way, right? Like the more that you try to help others, the happier that you become. And at that point, I had accumulated all this knowledge about happiness and well-being. And so I realized that I could use it to share it with people and support them. And that's when I feel like I finally became myself in many ways. That's so cool. And that led you to write New Happy. And I want to talk about the subtitle. Um, we yeah. kind of alluded to it earlier. Getting happiness right in a world that's got it wrong. Um, well, first of all, let's start with the wrong part. Where did, no. And I know we've kind of touched upon this a little bit, yeah. but where was, where was the world getting it wrong in, in just sort of a 50,000 foot view? So the world gets it wrong by teaching you to believe three things. The first is that you're not good enough. The second is that you can overcome that by achieving more and more. And the third is that you have to do it all by yourself. So those three beliefs are what lead us astray. Okay. Okay. And now the book is helping us get it right. So, yes. So uh, how do we get it right? We get it right by identifying all of the wonderful, unique gifts that you have, the qualities that bring you life and bring you joy, and then finding a way to share them with other people. So, you know, like for example, you being such an amazing interviewer and so full of life and zest and sharing it through this podcast, you're helping so many people all of the time. That's a great example to me of somebody using their gifts to serve the world. So that's how I would recommend that people pursue happiness. Oh, well, thanks. Thank you for the compliment. I really appreciate it. I, I always equate my uh, enthusiasm for obnoxiousness because no. mo most people are always like, they're, they're always like, you're so enthusiastic. And I'm like, I don't even realize, like as much as I try to be self-aware, like this is just my, this is my, it's this is my right? setting. Yeah, so it's I, great though because most people don't have that. It's something that's uniquely Joe, and isn't that cool? Isn't that amazing? I find that wonderful. Well, thank you. I appreciate. It. I my wife probably finds it irritating, but I, I appreciate it. Um, all right. So I've I've just been watching this show on Hulu called We Were the Lucky Ones, and I'm not sure mm. if you're familiar with it. But I've read the book. I haven't I haven't seen the show. Though. Okay. I mean, it's it's gut wrenching, <laughs> oh, and yeah. it's about if so if someone hasn't read the book or watched the show, it's about this family in Poland that's going through uh, World War II and the Holocaust. And it's it's just, well, I say, gut-wrenching. Like, And I wonder, when we complain about, there's a lot of stuff we talked about today, and what people have gone through in the past, I almost feel like this world needs a proverbial, like, share, slap in the face, snap out of it. Like, 
man, people have been through so much shit, like so, yeah. much, like 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 stuff that we, you would require like hundreds of years of therapy, not a few yeah. years of therapy. Yeah. And these people have, have survived it and thrived and built families. Yeah. What do we? How do we connect it to like the history of like how bad it was? To like yeah. we complain how bad it is now, but really it's just it's just like a drop in the bucket compared to yeah. what other generations have gone through. Tell me about that. Like, well, how yeah. would you, like, I know it's not much of a question, but it's more of like a of like how do we equate like the shit that people went through and the shit we're going through now? It's it's so interesting, right? Like, um, I I had the privilege of sharing my book with um a woman named Dr. Edith Eager, who is a Holocaust survivor, and she's ninety six now, um, and she. Um, she's still teaching, still out there sharing wow. her amazing wisdom. Um, and she's a expert in resilience and in healing from uh, unimaginable trauma, obviously. Yeah. And, um, she often talks about how there's no, um, you know, like hierarchy of suffering that pain is pain is pain. And that she, off she shares her experiences surviving the Holocaust to help people to understand that they can do it too. They can heal from the things that have happened to them in their lives. And she says that lots of, in her book, she writes, I believe that lots of people often come up to her and say, my problems are nothing compared to what you went through. And that's what she always says, says to them. And I, I think that that's a, obviously a very unique and important perspective given, given her experience and what she's, what she's been through. I think also we, we can think about the suffering that people have endured, are enduring in the world and use it not as something to shame ourselves for, like to say, oh, I'm, my life is so easy and therefore my pain doesn't matter, but to draw strength from in the way that she describes it, right? To think, wow, look at the capacity of the human the human spirit, right? Like look at what's possible for people. Look at these people, as you said, who have come out the other side and who have survived unimaginable horrors and still found a way to make lives of meaning and purpose and joy like they can they can be role models and exemplars for us and that's what i think is a helpful framing we can learn from from what they have been through and honor their their pain in these ways but in order to do that we have to be willing to engage with it we have to be willing to say like horrible stuff happens stuff that's so horrible that there are no words to describe how horrible it is and we have to pay attention to it and then identify how we can prevent it from happening as best we can now in the in the present moment and also to learn from it and to draw strength from it to get through our own challenges in our lives. That's great. And you know, everyone's always looking for a good hack, Stephanie. I'm sure you've looked for something, you know, a hack to fix this. Is there a happiness hack? Helping people. If you feel bad, if you're having a bad day, go help somebody, you will feel better. Oh, that's awesome. I love that. And lastly, uh, you know, we kind of joked about the the vileness of the internet and how people are mean to each yeah. other. But one of the things that's surprising is if you look at your Instagram feed, you have over a hundred thousand followers, and it's not like shots of you in the Mediterranean, <laughs> not you know you showing off your boat. It's just a lot of like quotes and, and little stories and ideas yeah. for happiness. Why do you think? your Instagram feed is connected with, you know, 100,000 followers. I mean, it's, it's well, amazing. And, and not that you're, you. do, you're not in your, you're not doing it for the likes as, as they say, yeah. but I'm just curious in terms of someone who's on the other side of that screen, why do you think it's connected with so many people? I think because deep down, we're not actually, we're not actually, um, like people want to be supported and they want help and resources. And so I have always, I really hated social media. So as somebody who is, uh, has a, you know, a large part of my work is on social media now. Um, it's very, it's been very interesting to go on this journey. I didn't even have a page before I started the new happy. And I, I was very, um, I really hated it because I felt like it epitomized so many of the old happy values of consumption and competition and, um, you know, excessive self-focus and gratification and all that stuff. And so I said, okay, well, I'm going to do this in a way that is in aligned with my values and in a way that's unique and supportive of that. And so I never, I only post there to help people. I only post there to give people resources and tools. And I think that if people respond to that, it's because they want those resources and support. And I think also they're, 
they're grateful for it. And people do want to connect and find meaningful relationships and, and be better. And it's almost like social media is denigrated in so many ways, but it's also a beautiful channel for helping people to grow and connect with one another if it's used with the right values in mind. No, that's great. Uh, and I always often ask like folks in all different <laughs> industries, even in entertainment, like, what's your DMs like? Uh, what is a, what is, what's the DM looking for on, on the happy Instagram? That's a great question. Um, I, I feel like I see the best of humanity in many ways. I have people sending nice things almost all the time saying thank you or asking thoughtful questions or sharing their perspectives. Um, I've been very fortunate to avoid any sort of, any major sort of like negativity and uh, cynicism in any way. So the messages that I get are mostly people saying, hey, I have this situation. Is there any way you can talk about this at some point or share any resources or tools? It's all about people wanting to learn and grow and express gratitude. So I feel, I feel very grateful. And it's funny, you know, we, talk, we started this uh, conversation by talking about how we challenge ourselves and we evolve. Yeah. And, and look at you, Miss Social Media Hater. And now <laughs> you have 100,000 followers and you're, you're, and you're connecting and actually helping people. So again, this yeah. is us just, I, 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 one totally. of the things I like to say is, you know, we can't change, but we can, we can improve ourselves. Like we, we're, we yeah. all have software that we can upgrade. And it seems we're... like that you've upgraded your software along the way when it comes to social media. Such a good call. Thank you for saying that. I never thought about that before, but you're right. What a, It's an example of how things are wherever you are today. It doesn't have to be where you end up. You can always change and grow. Awesome. Her name is Stephanie Harrison, the author of New Happy, Getting Happiness Right in a World That's Got It Wrong. Stephanie, thanks for the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I loved our conversation. And that's today's Good Listen. I'm Joe Partavilla. You can always connect with me on X, LinkedIn, or Instagram at Joe Partavilla or TikTok at Jay Partavilla. If you want to shoot me a note, you can email me at joepartavilla at protonmail.com. And lastly, if you can please leave a five-star review on Apple or Spotify, that would be amazing. And if you're watching this on YouTube, why don't you give us a big old thumbs up? It's a small gesture, and I'd really appreciate it. Thanks for spending some time with me today. Until next time, adios.